Thank you. Um, my name is Dana Redford, and I am an alcoholic. Amen. And I, yes, I brought notes up here, but I'm not going to read from them, I promise. Um, I just thought it would refresh my memory, and, and maybe I wouldn't wander around and bounce around quite as much as I normally do when I talk if I had some notes. Um, my sobriety date is June 11th, 1990. And I got sober in Southern Pines, and I'm actually from this area. Um, I didn't do all my drinking here. I traveled widely to, drink, to get very drunk. Um, I had just moved back from Australia when I quit drinking. They have really good beer there, I have to say. <laughs> um, I had already gotten to the point by the time I moved to Australia six years before that um, I had distanced myself from hard spirits because I couldn't control them, but wine and beer were kind of okay. And then I got to where wine I couldn't judge quite as well either. So I was drinking about a case of Australian beer by the time I uh, quit, which has quite a lot of alcohol in it. Um, before, what it was like before, I was... Um, one of two children. My parents did not drink, um, at least not when I was there. My father evidently had been a drinker and a partier as a young man, and he was in the military, and when he got told the next day about the great jokes that he had played on a fellow officer and he didn't remember it, he quit drinking. He was one of those rare people that was actually able to do that at that point. Uh, so I never knew him to be drunk. Um, it certainly ran in his family. It ran in my mother's family. So I was very fortunate to be brought up with them not drinking. Um, my brother and I, not so much, not quite so fortunate. Though if you ask my mother, she would say she has no alcoholic children. Um, my brother's been in the program a little longer than I have and encouraged me to get here, and I'm forever grateful for that. Um, I cannot remember a time when I felt like I was as good as everybody else or that I belonged, kind of fit in much of anywhere. Um, so I think I was, I don't remember going for a social drink. That concept has never really existed in my mind. Um, the first time I remember intentionally drinking with a bunch of other people in a social setting, I was at the ripe old age of 12, and I remember exactly where I was and how bad the beer tasted and how I kept drinking it anyway because I didn't want to disappoint my friends. I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be who they wanted me to be. So no matter how bad it tasted, I was going to keep doing it. Um, I was already smoking cigarettes by that time, too, so I was making a lot of really good decisions at that time. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I should probably back up just a little bit and say that my brother's four and a half years older than I am. Our father died when I was nine, and I was the light of his eyes, and my brother and my mother were very connected. So I felt very alone and that there was nobody I could go to as a parent, a role model, um, and discuss any of my loneliness or how do I fit in or how do I get past this. Plus, I was very independent. Um, I used to say determined. My ex-husband said stubborn is, well, uh, but yeah, all of that. <laughs> And, and I was fairly smart with, with books. I could read things and figure things out. And fairly logical. And so early on, I kind of got left alone to solve my own problems. And I did pretty well at it, according to my mom, what she remembered. Um, from my perspective, nobody cared enough to show me. So I showed myself. Now, was that self-centered and a little bit off kilter? Most likely. <laughs> But that was, that was my perception at the time. Um, as long as I can remember, I was always trying to do whatever it took to please the people around me, whether it was in school or 
uh, in a choir or in a church group or whatever. I continually was a people pleaser. And I couldn't figure out why so few relationships lasted in, into you know years. They would people would go off and be with other people, whether they were friends or boyfriends. Um, it wasn't until after I quit drinking and got some therapy that I finally figured out that if I wanted them to really care for me, I had to be me and care about myself. And that was something I didn't know how to do. Um, I was, there were bright moments, of course, but for the most part, I was a loner. I had my imaginary friend that I talked to. Um, pretty serious, even as a child. Um, at the age of three, I went to Sunday school for the first time and got in a fight with a girl and punched her and got kicked out of Sunday school. <laughs> she said I was a liar. <laughs> what was I going to do? <laughs> Um, but yeah, I had, had some stubborn streaks there. Um, I was kind of afraid after my father died to dream. He was sick several months before he had his final heart attack and died and was in the hospital for several weeks. And at, at the sage age of nine, I was very upset that he wasn't there and couldn't wait for the new year to dawn because it had been a really sucky year. And then he died on New Year's Day. So at a very young age, I learned not to say, oh, I can't wait until next week, or I can't wait until next month or next year. You've got today, and you don't know about the rest. So that told me, instead of making plans carefully and making other plans just in case, was not to make plans. That's how this alcoholic brain worked. Um, I, I had made some plans. I kind of got past that and made some plans when I was 21 about what I was going to have in my life by the time I was 25. They were totally unrealistic expectations if I'd been sober and working out really, really well in my life. Um, when I turned 25, I went into a very deep depression because I had reached none of my goals. Um, and I, I drank quite a lot. I bartended. I was a cocktail waitress. I spent most of my free time, which was most of my waking time, in bars. Uh, I did not isolate. I drank to get comfortable around people. And once I'd had a few drinks, I was comfortable. I no longer felt like people were, you know, looking at me or staring at me from a, from a, in a strange way. Maybe they were, but I wasn't aware of it. Um, and I was very afraid of looking foolish, afraid of being wrong, and I was very afraid of being lonely and of trusting people, which makes for pretty miserable existence. So I drank, and while I drank for quite a while, that, that helped a little bit. Um, I don't know why it never occurred to me to look for a more permanent solution before I did, but it didn't. The alcohol worked enough, and I was going to keep doing what I was doing. I did try a few other substances as well along the way, but thankfully never got addicted to any of those. Um, as a result of my drinking and my alcoholic way of thinking, I put myself into very unhealthy relationships. As I said before, I didn't care about myself enough, so how could other people really care for me? Um, I set myself up for abusive relationships, unrealistic expectations over and over and over. Blackouts passed out a lot. Um, it got to the point where I would figure out in my head how many calories my dinner would be, and I would trade that up for beer. Um, <clears throat> And needless to say, a lot of depression and anxiety when I wasn't drinking, <laughs> not to mention the hangovers. <clears throat> Excuse me. The last six years I was drinking, I was in Australia. I was married to an Australian man that I met at the Jefferson. And he had his own beer, Australian beer. And we were both amazed when the other one seemed to have a drinking problem. Go figure. Um, but his idea, and I thought it was a good one at the time, was 
he could help me change who I was, and then we'd both be happy. <laughs> and I was so sick, I actually believed him and tried it for almost six years. Um, and I got very, very miserable and knew I had to make some changes, didn't know what they were, but knew that I couldn't go on the way I was. Um, finally managed to get out of that and come back to Southern Pines. Um, and I had kind of made my mind up. I, I had tried to stop drinking several times in Australia and had even had a 12-step call done on me and had gone to a couple of meetings. My ex-husband was so jealous, he was sure I was meeting a lover <coughs> instead of going to meetings, and of course he wasn't gonna come to one, so I quit going to meetings. Um, I went without a drink for 10 days there, and it was the most miserable time I can remember of the six years I was there. Well, probably part of the problem was I could remember all 10 days, that was part of it. Um, but when I came back, I had made this decision that I was distancing myself from him because his drinking was a lot of my problem. And from all the things that I was used to and I was used to drinking around, and I was going to come here and I was going to put together a few days without alcohol. So I wasn't hungover and I wasn't blacked out. And I might be able to think clearly. I thought it was going to take three or four days to get there um, and make some life-changing decisions. Needless to say, that did not happen in three or four days. But I did stop drinking. I wasn't intending to stop forever. And that's what I had tried to do before. I was just trying to stop for a day, a few days. And I had a hard time. It wasn't easy. The cravings were pretty horrendous. Um, and I, again, didn't have people I talked to. I didn't even know about AA, really. I mean, I knew a little bit, but I wasn't ready to go there. I'm not really that bad yet. Mm -hmm. And I finally, at one point, just prayed to what I didn't know what or who God was, but I knew there had to be something out there, even though I wasn't sure that they were interested in me. But I begged for help, because I knew that I could not resist the cravings for alcohol. I could not do this on my own. I had to have help. And I begged and I cried. And it was probably the first time I had prayed that sincerely for help in my life. And I had a feeling of peace wash over me that's spoken of in a lot of religious scriptures, that a peace that passeth all understanding. It really did. And I can say, though it's been 23 years since I've had a drink, even though it has occurred to me to drink, and I've even had days that said, you know, if I could drink, I'd have a beer or two or three today on odd days. Um, I have not had that craving, that, that horrible craving that I lived with most of my life since that day. That was relieved for me. And then I started to hope that maybe some other things were possible. You know, I might actually be able to learn to make some good decisions. I might... Um, I didn't know what it might be, but there was hope, and there hadn't been hope in my life in a really long time. And I got talked into going to a meeting. Not by anybody here. I wasn't trying to connect with anybody here. I connected with people that lived in other states, other countries. Um, I finally got talked into going to a meeting, and I went to a speaker meeting. And I'm sure nobody wanted to pressure me because they didn't know me, but to me it felt like I was being pushed out the door and unwanted. Nobody came up and introduced themselves, and of course I wasn't brave enough to go and introduce myself to anyone. Um, I went home and called the person I promised to go to the meeting and say, okay, I did it, that's it. It's not for me. Those people were stuck up stuffy, stuck in their own heads. I'm not, mm -mm. <laughs> And I got talked into coming to one more meeting the next night, and it was Tom I's meeting at that time, the big book group. And he was leading the meeting that night, and he was in charge of newcomers that night. 
And I saw in him, for the first time since I prayed, I saw something else. I saw something to hope for. I saw his enthusiasm for life, his joy in living. And I wanted that really, really badly. I didn't know how I was going to get it, but he encouraged me and said, if I kept coming back and I got a sponsor and I did what it says, that I could have that 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 too could happen. And for the first time in a very long time, I actually trusted somebody. I trusted Tom. And he tried to hook me up with sponsors, and the first three didn't work out, probably more to do with me than them. But he was always on call. And if it was an al on call dealing with my ex, Fern was there for me. So. I adopted the Ivester family, whether they adopted me or not. <laughs> and they, they really, really helped me see what could be in my life. Um, I finally started conceiving of the notion of being myself. Didn't know who that was, so I had to find out. Um, <clears throat> and of course, first, when I tried to do that, I didn't like much of what I saw. Um, I've come to see most of the traits that we have as neither negative or positive, but they can be used in that way. Like, I can be really stubborn, and sometimes maybe that's what kept me coming back to meetings and what has, you know, made me determined to get this and, and made me keep coming back. Um, the other side to that, I can not know when to quit in a lot of different areas of my life. So there's, you know, it, being stubborn is not good or bad. It's how I use that, that it can hurt me or it can help me or help others or hurt others. So I'm learning. I'm still learning. Um, I've heard people talk about, you know, I'm not, I, I haven't reached that spiritual perfection yet. Um, I've, I've reached the point where I think God's the only one that has spiritual perfection, but as long as I keep trying to do the next right thing and I keep coming back and helping other people and, and being there and being able to ask for help, then then I think I, I, as long as I stay on that path, I think I'm, I'm doing pretty good. Um, my goal, I kind of reset new goals. And one reason I made notes here is a little over five years, well, seven years ago, my mother was in a very serious car accident. And <coughs> she has needed a lot of care since then, and I've been her primary caregiver for that time. And I tried to be everything to her and tried to do it for a couple of years and was warned by my doctor that it was going to kill me and went, yeah, 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 but I've got to do it anyway. And then I had a brain hemorrhage, <clears throat> which at the time I remember not long before that talking to somebody <coughs> excuse me, who said, you know, God taps you on the shoulder gently a few times to try to get your attention. And if you don't pay attention, he hits you between the eyes with a two before. Well, my brain hemorrhage was right there. <laughs> so um, I went in an ambulance up to Baptist Hospital, and I was laying there in neurology, critical care, saying, OK, you got my attention. <laughs> what do you want me to do now? And it showed me, okay, I had a fair amount of time in this program, but I had forgotten a lot of the principles. I was too busy to come to the meetings. I was so wrapped up in everything that I thought I was in control. And I evidently thought I was immortal, too. Um, that, that got changed very quickly. Um, it's, it's not been an easy five years. I really appreciate my husband, who's here, my current husband, who's here tonight, um, what he's had to put up with for the last five years with migraines and my mother and all that. It's, I'm sure it's not been easy for him. 
Um, but I've learned that I am human and that I'm not the center of the universe, even my mother's universe. And um, there are limitations to each of us and that I have to listen, be aware of guidance, be aware of what people say and do around me because I don't know how my higher power is going to talk to me. It could be through one of you. Somebody could just come up and say, I'm having a bad day, and it could be something I could say or do or just a hug or something that I could help. So I used to do what I was told and pray and, you know, go through all these steps. But I missed one. After I prayed for your will, not mine, I never hesitated to be receptive to whatever their will might be. I went on with my agenda. And even though I was intelligent, still am to some degree, um, my way of thinking, my alcoholic way of thinking, can get me from zero to 60 in a bad direction really fast. And I still have parts of that brain in here. I can still go there really fast. Um, the brain hemorrhage was one of the greatest gifts I had because it kept reminding me, stop, be present. What's going on now? What, what part do you need to play in this, if any? Um, people in these rooms have helped me a great deal by answering my questions when I got too self-involved, by letting me stand here and cry when I was having a really bad day and being okay about it, uh, which has happened more than once in these rooms. Um, there are a lot of people in here that I, that I have on my phone that I know I can call and I know they'll be there for me. And that in itself is such a different experience. Even though I was in AA before, I didn't participate in the way I do now. And I know I'm not here all the time, but I, I do sponsor and, and do have a sponsor. And I'm much more um, connected, go to other meetings when I can't make these. And I feel like this is my family now. I don't have much of a family anymore. Um, but people in these rooms are my family. And that's something I am grateful for every day. Um, I'm grateful, too, for the, the people that have come into my life as temporary and more permanent sponsees. Um, I've learned a lot from them and continue to learn from them. Um, I learned early on in my sobriety that I couldn't get somebody else sober, neither could I get them drunk. That I had a little bit of control over making that decision about myself, but it was really up to God, not me. I just needed to keep following the path and pray and stay present. Um, but I've seen people that I cared very much for not be ready for this and keep going back out, and I've lost some dear friends, and I'm sure I'll lose more. But I'm not in control. I am not. I have no control over anybody's sobriety. As much as I would like to be able to fix people <laughs> occasionally, that's not within my power. Um, <clears throat> but I, I get marvelous gifts from different people in here when they ask a question and I say something somehow in a different way from what they've heard before. Maybe just a different tone of voice and I can see that light bulb moment of like, oh wow, that's how that works. And it feels so good to be able to share some of this that works for me with some of you. If I could give away the gift to some people that are struggling, I would share it with people. But that's not, that's not within my power. Um, 
I've learned a lot about about what's not in my power. I had a difficult time from the beginning in AA because I took everything personally. What you did was somehow aimed at me. Now that's not self-centered at all, is it? Um, <laughs> and I, I'm finally, finally, at this point in my sobriety, coming to the point where I know that your actions whatever you say or do, are more likely more about you or whoever you're talking to than they are about me. And that's been a gift. That's just a tremendous weight. I still was trying to please people. And now I know that whatever I do, you're still going to be you, whether you're having a good day or a bad day. And you know what? I hope it gets better, but it's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> so this has been a... A journey with lots of teachers, some very unlikely ones, a lot of therapy, a lot of badly needed therapy, um, and remarkable friendships that last over years. There are a couple of people in these rooms that knew me when I was still drinking or knew me when I was just first in the rooms. Um, I was picking on Chip and Beth when they said they weren't going to be here tonight and said, oh good, I can talk about you guys. Um, but I knew Chip when I was in high school. And I don't remember a lot about him because I was so wrapped up in my own life at that time. I knew I knew him, but that was it. I couldn't tell you much about most of my friends except the ones that I stayed close to drank as much as I did or more or I wouldn't have been with them. And they made pretty poor choices, too, and most of them are dead. And I'm very, I'm grateful for what their deaths taught me, too, because they did scare me. And sometimes I needed that, the stubborn person that I am. I needed a little serious nudging now and then. And um, I do my best now to try to understand when something that I, I don't know how to deal with happens. Is there something I can do? Is there something in this that I can learn from? Is there some way that I can get something out of this that will maybe help somebody down the road? Um, I've learned through being here, through seeking more and more spirituality over the years. I've learned to meditate. I've learned to be calmer, as Karen was talking about, that I'm always calm. Well, not always. <laughs> um, and somebody today said, oh, you, look, you remind me of my mother, except she was so unhappy. You're nothing like her. And I said, oh, but you don't know. You don't know when I was. I was very unhappy. So through meditation, therapy, spiritual seeking, um, I've been reminded by a lot of people in a lot of parts of my life to be here now and to accept what is right now. Because one of the spiritual teachers that I was touched by quite a lot said that all human suffering is caused by struggling with what is, struggling with the truth. In other words, I don't want this to be this way. I'm going to make it my way so it fits me better. And you set up this war. And most of my life, I've been in war with myself and with reality. <clears throat> it's only as I let go of that struggle because the same teacher said okay you've got these two entities and they're struggling and they have a tug of war what happens if one of them stops the other one has nothing to struggle with and the struggle drops away too and i heard that but i didn't really hear it in my heart for quite a while but i'm i'm starting to get that that if i stop struggling with the reality of whatever is right now whenever right now maybe, 
I can be more at peace and I can be calmer. And I can be much happier. The, the amount of energy taken up struggling <laughs> with reality, I, I would, oh God, I'd love to have that bottled, what I had just done in my life. Now, there I go, bottle. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it, it would be great to be able to have some of that energy back that I used struggling. Um, even the first couple of years my mother was sick, a lot, a lot of energy. And I would get angry with her when she didn't do what I thought she needed to do for her best interest. She was 90 years old. She was going to do what she wanted to do. She's 97. She's still doing what she wants to do. <laughs> right? <laughs> and and uh, the only change is I've learned to accept that she is who she is. And... If I don't struggle with that, I can enjoy being around her. If I'm trying to change her into being someone that I expect her to be, either one of us have very much fun. So between AA, spirituality, spiritual teachers, church, wonderful friends, um, I'm learning to pick my battles, when I have to battle, I take it little piece at a time, what's what I have to do right now. I stayed on the phone with an insurance company for an hour and 15 minutes today and listened to music while I did it so it didn't get me stressed out. Um, so everything I approach today, being very cognizant that stress was, was a, probably a big factor in my brain hemorrhage, I do what I can to remove stress from the situation. If a sponsee comes to me and they're very distressed, which happens, I try to help them get down to the bottom of what's distressing them so they can let go of the distress and see what the problem is and see how to deal with it. And I think that helps them. I know it helps me. Um, and I never know when that phone call or when that text or whatever is going to come. So I want to be as calm as I can be, as much of the time as I can be. Um, and I, I have heard from several people lately, oh, you're always in such a good mood. You're always so calm. You're always so... And I think, oh, boy, if you only knew. <laughs> and I'm not always that way. Um, I think it was a kung fu movie or, or maybe it was a karate kid that, that the um, master of the arts was always seemed to be balanced and centered and they asked him how he stayed centered and he said, I don't. I just come back to center more quickly than most people notice. So when something comes at me, I am centered. But I don't stay there. I go out and I come back, I go out and I come back, and that's kind of how I am. And I tell people that I pray a lot a day. I don't get on my knees a lot, but throughout the day as I'm doing things, maybe I'm sitting in traffic, I think, help me breathe, help me relax, show me what I need to do, show me where, how I need to do what I'm doing. And it's, it is the most transformative thing in my life, being able to pray and ask for help and listen once I've asked. Um, I just want to encourage anyone who's new, fairly new, back in new, this hasn't been easy. This, particularly the first year or two, was hell, honestly, in most of the time, in most ways, because I had to change so many things about myself. <clears throat> Not change who I was, but change the way I thought about things. And that was very hard for me. And I resisted it. I was stubborn. I was hard-headed. Um, it's been the most difficult voyage. And the most rewarding thing I can think of in my life. I would not trade anything in the last 23 years 
for anybody else's life. No matter how happy they seem, I am so happy now and I'm so grateful to be a recovering alcoholic. And that's all I have to say. Thank you.